Hey guys, Alex here from the DMs Club on the Titan Bear Gaming YouTube channel. I'm continuing to go through Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and today I'm focusing on the new oaths that are available for the Paladin class. Now, if you'd like to follow along, the Paladin class begins on page 36 of Xanathar's Guide. And like all the other classes, it starts off by first talking about specifics about roleplay, the different details that might be part of your Paladin's background, or ultimately just some thematic ideas that you can use to start coming up with new Paladins for yourself. The first concept it talks about is the personal goal. This basically seems like a more advanced version of your bond or an ideal that you might have from the normal player's handbook. It is things like peace, you fight so that future generations will not have to, revenge, your oath is the vehicle through which you will right an ancient wrong, duty, you live up to what you have sworn to do or die trying, different motivations that your character might believe in and then use to influence their actions over the course of their game. The second one is symbol, and this one is actually pretty common. The fight had this, the monk had this. This is basically trying to come up with the idea that symbolism is important for a paladin or for any of these martial oriented fighters. And then they try to hold that symbol as a uh, example of their beliefs or some kind of, of un unifying marker that you can use to rally to your cause. And it does explicitly talk about here that maybe this would be something on a banner or a flag or on your clothing or something like that. And they give you some cool ideas, a clenched fist, a red heart, an unblinking eye, stuff like this that helps really channel the idea of this tenacious paladin. The next section talks about a nemesis that you may have and gives some interesting ideas for what kinds of adversary would motivate your, your paladin in the game. A mighty orc war chief threatens to overrun and destroy everything you hold sacred. A dragon whose servants dog your steps. It's some nice ideas. Take a look at the section. It's worth thinking about. And the last section talks about temptation. What kind of little darkness might your character be contending with to help exemplify the fact that they are a pillar of light? otherwise. This is very similar to the section in the clerics part where it talks about having a dark force that you contend with or a doubt in your faith or something along these lines, and it just helps give an extra level of dimensionality to your character. So there are two new oaths that we get here in Xanathar's Guide, the Oath of Conquest and the Oath of Redemption, and they really couldn't be farther apart in terms of thematic element between them. They're basically on complete opposite ends of the morality spectrum. Your Oath of Conquest is a paladin that really skirts the bottom of, of what you would consider to be either good or neutral gameplay at a role-playing game. It really is, is the closest thing to evil that I think anybody would really be able to consider at the game. And the re uh, Redemption Paladin goes in the complete opposite direction. It believes in peace wherever possible and focuses on uh, very pacifistic avenues, and they achieve it in a very interesting way. But let's first talk about the Oath of Conquest. The Oath of Conquest is about conquest. It's about conquering people. It's about trying to subjugate, and it's about victory in battle, basically at all costs. In the thematic section, they talk a little bit about how Hell Knights end up exemplifying this, and that paladins of other orders most commonly uh, oppose knights of this particular style, this particular oath, because they can be so ruthless in what they're doing. If you're going to play this as a player character, you've got to be careful about how exactly you want to play this off without hitting an evil character. Like most paladins, you're going to get a whole bunch of spells that are going to be permanently added to your paladin spell list, and that really flavors the style of your character. All the spells that this that this one gets, the Oath of Conquest gets, are all very um, vicious, or they're kind of ruthless. And they all kind of have a dark flair to them. You get Armor of Agathis at third level. You get Hold Person at fifth level. Fear at ninth level. Uh, dominate Beast, Cloud Kill at 17th level. You get all kinds of uh, very mean oriented spells. The channel divinity options that you get at third level are interesting and useful. The first one, Conquering Presence, is your bread and butter spend an action. Make creatures that can see you within 30 feet frightened of you for a minute if they fail a wisdom save. This power starts off the fact that all the rest of the powers here are all very fear-oriented. This is kind of why I say that the Oath of Conquest Paladin really is the very bottom of a heroic adventure or even a neutral adventure. You're very fear-centric. You are going to be trying to inspire fear in the enemies around you. And because this is on a short rest, you're going to be doing this a lot. This is going to be a core mechanic that you're making use of as an Oath of Conquest Paladin. The other channel divinity option that you get is Guided Strike, and this one's a little bit more neutral. This one just says that when you make an attack roll, you you can use your channel divinity to just add plus 10 to the attack roll. You can do this after you roll and before the dungeon master declares whether or not you've hit or not, and, and it doesn't take an action of any kind. You just expend your use of channel divinity to do it. So it's good. It's a powerful one, and like I said, since you're, gonna, you're able to do your channel divinity every short rest, you're going to be able to channel one of these two frequently. 
When you reach seventh level, you pick up Aura of Conquest, and most of the Paladin archetypes do get some kind of aura effect at seventh level. This one's interesting, and it plays very heavily off of your fear uh, channel divinity, your conquering presence that you have. At seventh level, you emanate a menacing aura while not incapacitated. It's 10 feet around you like all the rest of your auras. If a creature is frightened of you, its speed is reduced to zero while in your aura. Further, that creature takes psychic damage equal to half your paladin level as it starts its turn there. This is big. This means that you're going to be, in order to get use of this, you want to try to frighten as many uh, enemies as possible around you and then wade into combat. You lock them in place and they take passive damage from you. This is big. This is going to be the, the primary mechanic that you're trying to make use of. At 15th level, you pick up Scornful Rebuke, which is anybody who dares to strike you is physically punished for their audacity. If you get hit with an attack, the creature takes psychic damage equal to your charisma modifier if you're not incapacitated. Cool. It's a basic thorns. And at 20th level, you pick up Invincible Conqueror. Now, it's a 20 20th level thing, so it's going to be absurdly powerful and only going to happen at the very end of your game. This one turns you into kind of a war machine. For one minute, you spend an action and you become the avatar of conquest. You get resistance to all damage. When you take the attack action, you can make one additional attack as a part of that action. And you crit on a 19 or a 20 instead of just a regular 20. You can't use it again until you finish a long rest. So this one's interesting. The Oath of Conquest Paladin, like I said, has a very dark flair to him. They have a very dark thematic element. You are a fear monger. You are trying to terrify the things around you. If that's what you want to be playing for your Paladin, this is the thing that you want to do. Conversely, we have Oath of Redemption, which is on the exact opposite side. You've kind of got your Dark Knight on one end and your White Knight on the opposite end. The Oath of Redemption Paladin tries to go off the, the idea that all living things are redeemable. And it does make the, the important distinction here that you're not a fool. You're not trying to naively pursue this avenue. Undead and fiends and demons and devils and things are beyond uh, redemption and that's fine. They're not trying to make it so that you're playing a pacifist character, but it does want to try to channel this idea that if you're going up against some kind of mortal, that you try to redeem their soul, that that's going to be a very heavy thematic element that you're trying to channel. And they give you interesting powers to help you achieve that. I actually like the power set that they've given you here because it's not just just, I'm not going to fight. They channel interesting ways. The spells that you pick up are all very good for helping to make it so that you, you can be useful in combat for your friends and for the rest of your party uh, without having to actually break this thematic idea of you dealing damage and cutting people in half every time that you get an opportunity. The spells you get are things like Sanctuary and Sleep, Calm Emotions, Counterspell, Attilakis, uh, uh, Re Resilient Sphere, Stone Skin, Hold Monster. Nice things that help put barriers between you or to keep a monster um, locked in a status of some kind to keep them from harming you while you can then handle the rest of them and, and whatever else. Gives you an interesting way to help pacify an individual creature or a set of creatures while not just being useless to the party. At third level, when you pick up your channel divinity, you get Emissary of Peace, which is a cool one as an action, you, or sorry, as a bonus action, you grant yourself plus five bonus to charisma checks for 10 minutes. It's great. It's a non, it's a non-combat roleplay oriented bonus. That's pretty good. And, you, and then you also get a Rebuke the Violent as the other option. You use your channel divinity so that whenever anybody within 30 feet of you deals damage with an attack against a creature other than you, so you can't use this for yourself, you can use your reaction to force the attacker to make a wisdom save, and on a failed save, they take damage equal to the amount of damage that they just dealt. This could be really big if you're going up against some kind of singular monster, some kind of big bad evil guy that hits really hard. You could use this to do exactly the same amount of damage that they did to your friend, and you can use it reactively. You can use it once the damage has already been dealt, and you see that it was a big shot. So this one can be really powerful, and since it is a channel divinity, you can use it every short rest. At seventh level, you pick up Aura of the Guardian. This one is any time that a creature with Within 10 feet of you takes damage, you can take the damage for them instead. So this helps give you kind of a self-inflicting style while helping pr to protect your friends. You can use your reaction to magically take that damage instead of the creature taking it. It doesn't transfer any of the other effects that might accompany the weapon shot or the spell effect, and you can't reduce the damage any further when you are taking the damage. That one's an interesting one, and it pairs very nicely with your 15th level thing, Protective Spirit, which is that a Holy Presence mends your wounds in battle. You regain hit points equal to 1d6 plus half your Paladin level, and your, if you end your turn in combat with fewer than half of your hit points remaining, you just recover that much hit points every round until you get back to half of your hit points. That's pretty cool. 20th level, you pick up Emissary of Redemption, which helps kind of turn you into this 
permanent uh, pillar of your belief system. You have resistance to all damage dealt by other creatures, including their spells, uh, attacks, other kinds of effects. And whenever a creature ha hits you with an attack, it takes radiant damage equal to half the damage that you take from the attack. So you're just this crazy thorns bot walking around, dealing damage to things just by walking into their vicinity. You do need to channel kind of a pacifist mentality for this because the feature turns off against a creature if you attack them or do some kind of spell against them or something like that. The Oath of Redemption is an interesting one. I think that it still suffers from the same general problem that a pacifist oriented character does, which is it is a game about combat. It's a game about fighting. And even if you are going to try to take the philosophical or moral stance that you shouldn't be fighting, you've got five party members or four party members that are all going to want to try to go out and bash stuff with hammers or light things on fire. And so it can be a little bit difficult to contend with. I like that they gave you these powers here that don't directly contradict your party wanting to do violence and you might needing to do violence violence yourself, being able to do hold spells or sanctuary spells or taking damage for your friends or just returning damage as a thorns aura as a rebuke of like, ah, you shouldn't have dealt damage to someone. Now you take the damage yourself. The evil undoes evil. It helps to make this a little bit more playable. I still think it's going to be a little bit tough to play. But conversely, the Oath of Conquest Paladin that we now have is really dark. It's almost like we have too light on one side and too dark on the other side. I think it's to, in order to play either of these, it's going to to take a level of creativity from the player and probably a level of cooperation between the player and the dungeon master to really feel out how this character is going to be able to play at the table in practice, how your mechanics are going to happen, what kind of personality your character is going to undertake, because we've got such extremes between light and dark. So let me know what you guys think of the oaths for the paladin here. Do you like them? Do you not like them? Do you agree with me? Think that they're a little bit too complicated or maybe channeling their individual thematic elements a little bit too hard and it might make it tough to play at the table. Let me know. Leave me a comment down below or come find me over on social media at Titan Bear Gaming. I'd love to talk to you about it over there. Like this video, subscribe to the channel so you can see when other stuff is coming out. Otherwise, until next time I see you, have more fun, would you? It's good for you.